Well, we've reached the last of our trialogues, and so it's fitting that we should cast our minds toward last things, since this both seems to be the theme of the crisis of the present moment, and also the unique unifying thread throughout the Western religion that most insistently of all religious systems on earth, it is the Western systems that have insisted in appointing an end to their world. Uh, the cyclical worlds of Hinduism are cycles of time so vast that they lose all force on the popular imagination. But what uniquely distinguishes Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is this insistence that God will come tangential to history in a way that will create uh, a scenario of last days, of a great uptaking of souls into the mystery of God. This idea which is called apocalyptic in its more uh, catastrophic version and millenarian in its more pastoral version is the idea that is the necessary correlative to the concept of uh, Eden and the unique moment of man's creation by God. If man's creation occurred at a unique moment in the history of the universe, then presumably after the expiation of the sin of Eden, God will gather man once again into the mystery. So this idea, <clears throat> which when encountered outside the religious framework in individuals, it, uh, in a secular or desacralized uh, vocabulary, is labeled pathology. It, it, the expectation of eminent transformation of the environment with the individual somehow playing a central role, this recognized pathological symptom in the individual is nevertheless uh, the driving force behind much of our own civilization. We as educated rationalists, the most rational 5% of society, in spite of our pretensions to intellectual revolution, we are far, I believe, from feeling the real force of what this is. But at the folkloric level, the attractor of the end of the world is very strong. and. Uh, you may recall some five years ago the Secretary of the Interior was asked why he wasn't saving more of America's forests. And he replied that since Jesus was coming, he saw no reason to save the forest because the end of the world was imminent. So uh, I, I find this thinking very interesting and I have personally certainly experienced its power. Uh, what is this intuition? of the end of the world. And now that we're beginning to gather more data, uh, that science is actually beginning to pay back on the promises made in the 18th century and give us a complete and deep description of at least the physical and astronomical universe, what we're seeing is a highly chaotic um, domain. There isn't a... Uh, stable body in the solar system that isn't deeply pockmarked with in asteroidal impact from the inner planets to the moons of the gas giants. There is tremendous visual uh, evidence of uh, catastrophic episodes throughout uh, the history of the solar system. So uh, we discussed uh, uh, in another meeting, inconsistencies in nuclear theory with the output of neutrinos from the sun. Is there a problem there? Human history uh, itself, uh, in, to my mind, can be seen as a kind of shock wave attendant upon the eschatology. That if we were to imagine for a moment that God 
or a super transmundane mind were to enter into the ordinary biological and evolutionary life of a planet, then I think we would have to agree that there would be some kind of shockwave of anticipation, some kind of sense of the eminence of the disruption of ordinary events before it was in fact eminent. And uh, this very brief period which we have experienced over the past 20,000 years is this thing, I believe. And these religions which have anticipated this thing in this rather crude end-of-the-world scenario are somehow on to something, something that is, I think, a message coming from the biological level, if you will, uh, about the inherent instability of the world. Ralph's models and Prigogine's models and all this has established the role of the unexpected perturbation in the creation of the cosmos, but I don't think we've quite factored it into our day-to-day -day model of what's going on. One of the startling things that I find when I look back on my own life of slightly more than 40 years is the number of things that have happened in my life that we were told would never happen. I mean, I have seen presidents assassinated, human beings landed on the moon, uh, robots to Mars, all of these high improbabilities in a single lifespan, which we all share. So I think that uh, we are sort of on automatic pilot with our assumptions that in spite of all our theory making, we are living in a, basically a probabilistic, uh, synchronistically flattened universal plane. What if the urgency and the uniqueness of the human historical moment actually signaled yet more urgent and even more exotic moments to come and that we are somehow witness to a major phase transition in the career of self-reflecting bios in the universe and that for us it's the end of the world but you know this is a meaningless phrase it's simply a complete systemic reorganization on the uh, scale of metamorphosis in lepidoptera it's just a complete meltdown of the previous world system and then uh, a recasting at the behest of higher mind Gaian mind the world soul it isn't clear but uh, if we could strip the provincialism from the message of these apocalyptic uh, religions, I think they are, they explain what history is. They have a deep intuition of instability. And uh, in the same way that I described the reluctance of plants in a botanical garden to venture out on an unstable tree limb, I think uh, these apocalyptic religions are trying, they are all prophetistic religions. They are trying to extract something out of the human future that is of no casual interest. It may in fact involve uh, the survival, yes or no, of uh, the planet. So I'm interested in ideas of, like that the transcendental object is somehow leaking information back into the past at a 3% rate or something like that, that uh, shamans and mystics and psychedelic travelers are in fact getting a very incomplete, low-grade signal about this event that is I think, based on what we talked about last night, somehow built into the structure of space and time, that the presence of our minds indicates that we are very near this enormous compressing singularity. Minds cannot exist except within, you know, 25,000 years of complete concrescence of one of these things. They do not arise in parts of the universe where concrescence is not approaching its climax. So 
uh, I don't really know the relevance of all this for theory making if in fact the the concrescence is upon us, then really all we can do is chat about it as it comes down around our ears over the next 25 years. And it, we are in such a tidal grip of the field that it really doesn't matter. We can only observe it knowing, having you know, the meager satisfaction that we made a, a, a amusing model of it. If longer periods of time are available, then uh, you know it might be worthwhile to undertake to study this phenomenon and its role in human history and so forth and so on. But it, uh, it's more than simply the calendrical pressure from the approach of the second millennium. It's also all these graphs drawn by very straight people of resources and population density and demand for hydroelectric energy and levels of strontium in milk and all of this stuff. I mean, who can look at all this stuff and not say it's either the yawning grave or there's going to be a complete, the lake is going to turn over, there's going to be a complete system reversal uh, because this cannot go on. It's abiotic. And I think life has a terrifying tenaciousness. I mean, life seized hold of this planet a billion years ago, a billion and a half, two billion years ago, and managed it through hellfire again and again, managed it back towards stable equilibria that were supportive of biota. And, you know, there were asteroid infalls and continents ground to dust, and we don't even know what went on. And life... Uh, kept hold of this chunk of ground. So uh, I think uh, the advent of intelligence must signal a crisis of a greater magnitude. That's why I suggest that the stellar dynamics should be looked at very carefully or something like that. It's a different order of magnitude. Uh, and it's seeping into our religions and into our politics and into our um, psychedelic experiences and into the general imagination. I, I think we're standing on the lip of a uh, hyperdimensional volcano of some sort toward which all history is being poured at a great rate. We have the peculiar f good fortune of fulfilling the wish conveyed in the uh, Irish toast, may you be alive at the end of the world. So that's it, gentlemen. Now we can just kick this around. Uh, Some questions come up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there, um, there seem to be two stages to this uh, apocalyptic vision, this particular one. Uh, first is, uh, the first stage is the uh, confidence in an apocalypse coming sometime. And the other component is the location of the date, um, 20 years or so hence. Mm -hmm. You mean in my personal belief? Yes. Uh -huh. So, in about the first one, um, it does seem sort of logical somehow that if there's a big bang at the beginning, and there would be a big bang at the end, and the creation story in Genesis and the precedent myths might somehow be seen to imply that, but but I don't know. I wouldn't think that's enough to go on. You know. But then he said that in the uh, in these traditions, Hebrew, Christian, Islam, that there's a definite tradition um, of an end in the mild form, the millenary, and in the strong form, the apocalyptic. Correct. Well, what is it exactly? What is the Secretary of the Interior referring to? He's is referring this, to in, this, in the Gospels or somewhere. No, in the, in the Revelation of Saint John, this thing is laid out. It's very complex. Angels come and pour down diseases. Oceans boil. It takes a long time. Uh, there are plagues of scorpion-like creatures that come from the interior of the earth. Certain people are marked with a sign, and they are the elect. And this, it's just this completely bizarre production that is the one of the most puzzling pieces of literature in the Christian canon. 
in the uh, textual basis uh, for this fantasy is entirely this revelation of St. John the Divine. That's right. And is that the apocalyptic, the millenarian, or both? Both. It, yes, because at the end you see the twelve-gated city, the new Jerusalem, a flying saucer, comes. I mean, you can tell. I mean, the, the description is, you know, it's covered with jewels. It has twelve gates. It's God's kingdom come to earth, and it comes to receive the elect. And as the oceans boil away and the damned are dragged into hell for eternity, these people with these special things shining in their heads go into this thing to be with God in eternity. And the whole thing is flushed. We'll have the sunglasses specially ready to sell them. <laughs> in this textual basis for this fantasy, yes. is there any idea about the date? Uh, well, yeah, the, at the time of Christ, the people who immediately followed Christ expected it within their lifetime. Amen, amen, I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away until these things are accomplished. People it was expected immediately? Immediately, and there was this like weird... There's been disappointment after disappointment. Well, yes, there was this weird 120-year period where they didn't get the serious job of getting organized together because everybody was standing around waiting for the end of the world. And then after about 120 years, people like Origen and Eusebius and these people came forward and said, listen, enough of this waiting for the end of the world, we have to get this scene It's organized. seriously overdue. Yes, let's get organized and, and get our hands on some real estate. And now that it's so, so seriously overdue and people have been disappointed time after time, Yes, I would think that the force of the prophecy has declined. In any case, I just want to ask you this. Have you any way of guessing why the Secretary of the Interior thought, the, thought that the end was coming imminently. I know why you think oh, so. Oh, yes, because there are all these fundamentalist cults in the United States, some whose adherents number in the tens of millions, who believe that, you know, in, that it's happening, that it's underway. I mean, within the spectrum of Christian belief, you can go with the Seventh-day Adventists who hold the most extreme position, which is that it occurred in 1847. I love that position. <laughs> <laughs> and that we yes. are now living in the millennium. This is the millennium. Yes, can't you tell? <laughs> so, so that's the most uh, right-wing view. And then there are those who undergo the formality of at least locating the date decently in the near future. Uh, and the year 2000, and it's the end, the turning of the aeon. Everybody has a way of decoding. This is one of the weird things about millenarian speculation. The person who discovers the key to the millenarian date, it always is just a few years ahead. Of it's you. It's you. Now, I just have a couple more questions for the direct examination, then we'll tur turn the witness over for the cross-examination. Okay. How many, uh, what, what percentage more or less of the human population of planet Earth at the moment is involved in this uh, Hebrew, Christian, and Islam religion? Third, I'd say. I could say maybe. However, if you're trying to count the adherence to the apocalypse theory, you have to count all the adherence of scientism as well, because they too, with their uh, you know greenhouse effects and CFCs and acid rain, I mean they're the. That's most another story. I do think that might be even a bigger danger, but that's another story. Right now, well, I'm after the, the revelation of, the of Saint John the Divine. No, this is so, the end of the world scenario of scientism. And then we've had the end of the world scenario of, of nuclear holocaust. Yes. Hanging over for decades. That's I mean, right. That's a ready, ha ready to hand yes. scenario. Oh, yeah, the ocean. So it's coming oil. from the same culture. But I, I just wonder how, uh, how much credibility to give to the uh, Christian apocalyptic vision when less than half the human population is involved. It doesn't mean that just that half of the planet would be uh, vaporized while the other half kept well, on no, going I, because see, I they... don't think it's a vaporizing. What it is is it, the, all these scenarios are metaphors for something really weird. 
a world which we are true. in a I know much better the flying saucer, but you did mention the uh, position to anticipate it than John the Divine of Patmos was. Well, you sort of started on the scientific end with the mention of the uh, astronomical chaos and the right. craters on all the other bodies and the fall of neutrinos from the sun and so on. Catastrophic but, scenarios, you mean? Yes. Yes. Well, the positive scenarios are are simply more far-fetched. I mean, one of the ones I've been playing with recently that I really like is that it ain't no big deal. It's just that time travel is discovered. It's a technological artifact. It's done in laboratory. The door is open right? on this little tunnel and you just walk through. And history ends. History ends. Just bang, it ends. And that's the end of history. And people look back at it the way you look back at the Pueblos or something and say, you know, people used to live like that in linear time. Weird. All, str all you know, waiting for stuff to happen and, and uh, all in this weird jelly of stiffened dimensionality and, boy, aren't we glad we've got that behind us. And to the people who were born in it, the previous mode of existence would be mere rumor and it would be simply a technological artifact. I think that this actually, well, uh, after reading Nick Herbert's book, this, uh, did I talk to you about the idea about the kind of time machine where he hypothesized this notion of a principle which works like this. Time travel is possible. Mm -hmm. Once it's discovered, you'll be able to travel into the future. When you're in the future, you'll be able to travel back into the past but no further than the moment of the discovery of the first time machine. Because before that moment, there were no time machines. And how can you take a time machine into a universe where time machines With don't With nobody exist? knowing it. Yes. So there is this physical barrier to time travel past the moment of discovery of it, backward before that moment. Well, I thought this was very interesting because I wanted to imagine this is a practical apocalypse. This is a, a I wanted to imagine what would it be like if uh, this kind of time machine were discovered. And so I imagined that it's December 22nd, 2012 A.D. at the La Chirera World Temporal Mechanics Institute and they're counting down and the Lady Tempo Knot has been strapped into the time machine and they count down and they push the button and she sails off into the future. Now the interesting question is, what happens right there? In the next Millions moment. of people arrive from a more populated yes. part of the universe. Millions of time machines arrive yes. from all possible Little parts capsules, of the future. Sneaking through the bushes, pretending they were there all the time, to asking see, for groceries. Exactly, to see the moment, this historic moment, the, the first time travel, which defines the barrier as far as you can go in your time machine. And people say to each other, have you been to the edge? It's 35,000 years from here. Have you been back and seen Abraham, the Abraham machine uh, take off. Well, so I, I loved this idea and I, and I held it for about 48 hours as a great gimmick. And then I realized that there was a peculiar problem with it which has to do with the grandfather paradox, that one of these people from the far future could stop off on their way back to see Ralph's machine take off. They could stop off and kill their grandfather and set this paradox in motion, which has been the defeat of all time travel schemes. So then I had what I believe is <clears throat> a serious delusional breakthrough, <laughs> which was, I said, aha, there's something, oh, well, here's the model that you have to have to understand the next stage of this argument about the apocalypse. You know how the Bernoulli gas laws work. So imagine a, um, imagine a vacuum-filled elliptical tank. We introduce a burst of oxygen at one end of this tank. 
Now, according to Bernoulli's laws, what happens? It diffuses evenly throughout and comes to a state of equilibrium, correct? Well, let's think for a moment of the planet. Now we'll make a geometric model one dimension down. Think of how today, 1989, on this planet, we have all kinds of different levels of cultural achievement, like we have t central Tokyo and Beverly Hills, but we also have Amazon rainforest people and pygmies and Berbers and all these people. Well, now if you think of cultural values and technological prowess and scientific uh, acumen as particles in this gaseous environment, then which way do you think values are moving in order to establish equilibrium? Well, the answer is obvious. More people in the Amazon are interested in what the Japanese are thinking than Japanese are interested in what Amazonian Indians are thinking. In other words, the higher state of cultural accomplishment is slowly swamping all less advanced states of cultural accomplishment for, without arguing about the, you know, what these terms mean in terms of advanced. But one culture is swamping another. Okay, to return to the time travel problem then, a weird effect would ensue upon the invention of this forward-going kind of time travel that I'm hypothesizing. It can be described with several different linguistic models. One way of saying it is when the Lady Templenot goes off into the future, the all of the rest of the future unto, as Wordworth says, the, uh, in, as long as date shall give a name to time, all of that future undergoes some kind of collapse and happens instantly. Yeah. It happens instantly so that the most advanced state of human accomplishment, even if it be billions of years in the future and absolutely beyond our ability to imagine in any way will appear one millisecond later on the other side of this barrier. So then I thought, my God, we're not inventing time travel here. What we're inventing is time death. A god whistle. That's what it is. It's a god whistle. You create this technology and it just takes the entire future history of the universe up until its conclusion and compresses it down into the next few milliseconds as the thing spins down and then you are face to face with the end purpose of all evolution and all process and all pattern and all energy, space, time, and matter. I mean, you come out next to the big girl. And uh, this would work, I think. This is not the edge of the West, it's the edge of the rest. <laughs> the edge of the rest, yes. It's so, um, there you have it. Uh, a complete fulfillment of the monotheistic intuition of apocalypse. With, and what it is, it's wonderful. It's that we figured it out. It's like the universe is this huge conundrum and you're in there and you're suffering and it's just this weird dream. And then there's science and religion and magic and you're fumbling and you're fun and then you slowly go toward this thing and it turns out it is. The stone is real. There is alchemical gold and when you grasp this to yourself then you know time ends, space ends, matter ends, everything ends and you go into the conclusion, the payoff, the jackpot. It's uh, you go over the cusp and you uh, meet the management. Probably this hasn't happened yet. No, 2012. I think. <laughs> <laughs> that brings us to the second question. <laughs> as to this uh, 2012, as already discussed, there were different um, alternatives in the interpretation of this date as based on the time wave by itself, such as a reflection point of zero novelty and so on. So I think that this um, particular apocalyptic fantasy of yours is actually a syncretism between the apocalyptic paranoia on the one hand and the time wave on the other hand. 
because even if one is convinced of apocalypse but not knowing when, it's not necessary to associate it to the year 2012. No, no, it certainly isn't. Um, it isn't necessary to associate it with that. That's a more, that, you know, you enter into the slippery realm of human judgment and data fields and this and that. The fact that it fits it so well and that without the time wave there is all this uh, millenarian and apocalyptic pressure because of the turn of the millennium seems pretty suggestive to me. The Mayan thing is another coincidence. I mean, really, yes, the Mayans and the Christians were within 12 years of each other in a way, if you take the year We have the coincidence of several sacred documents. Yes. The revelation of St. John the Divine. Yes. The time wave, another sacred document in software form. <laughs> and the Mayan. software. And the, and the Judeo Mayans. Christian calendar. Or the no. Gregorian calendar. No, I, I, I don't think a round number like 2000 has got anything to do. I mean, it didn't happen in the year 1000. No, but there was so, millenarian hysteria like you wouldn't believe. I mean, they didn't get any work done see, for two Ruth years. Benedict had studied 60 different cultures and she charted them out by all different parameters and finally she sorted them into three bins the Apollonian, the Dionysian and the paranoid. Now it just happens that the, uh, a paranoid culture having this paranoid religion or at least with a paranoid element in it contributed by Saint John the Divine happened to get these extraordinary technical powers with which are great uh, generators of toxicity and so on. Well, the term paranoid is designed to make you not like it. It the implicit point of view in calling it paranoid is one of scientism. The, uh, having been called paranoid, I know that uh, this is what they do. The, if you're labeled this, nobody's going to look into it. The it makes the implicit assumption that there's nothing to be paranoid about. Yet, in fact, we live in a very peculiar and dynamic and unsteady universe, and it's very important to us as creatures to have stability, equilibrium, and evenness of conditions. So to argue it isn't paranoia, it may well, in fact, be a a sensitive a sensitivity to the they always uh, say that yes that's fine but um, <laughs> the fact is from my point of view I mean I'm just a person hanging around here I've never read the revelation of St. John the Divine maybe I will or maybe I won't if I do read I certainly don't believe that it's any kind of document with any credibility you see I, I know that there are some uh, fundamentalist Christians around who take every word of the Bible very seriously and they believe it but here is like somebody as far as I'm concerned somebody's paranoid fantasy was put down in a book well no I don't take I don't so now they're paranoid I don't too. think revelations is the interesting thing to discuss what's the interesting thing where possible scenarios of sudden catastrophic phase transition in the well, natural now, world winter, I believe in that well but these are mundane I mean I outlined one for yes. you that had a little teeth in it there are others uh, you know, collision. This thing we talked about, where the, the two, the, the, the matter and antimatter universes collide and leave a photonic shell under the aegis of a new physics. Well, that's like uh, a schedule for five billion years hence. Hard to get. Or tomorrow, about. there is no way to predict when such a thing would happen, and the notion that it's far away. You see, the presence of minds is the signifier of nearby singularity. It's totally hypothetical anyway. It's just a model. That so idea we, that minds signify the nearness, nearby uh, no, the approach of a singularity. No, the anti-universe in the synchro clash. Oh yeah, I know, but you can put 20 or 30 of these things. There are all kinds of... I think of the asteroid things. collision, I mean a comet, I mean that's likely. There was a near pass recently, I think it was last Oh yes, month. and did you see when it's coming back? 2012. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to come it. closer. Past the last go. Now I believe it myself. <laughs> I clipped it out of astronomy magazine. I knew people would doubt. They said, they said, uh, uh, exact computation is impossible. But late in 2012. <laughs>
<laughs> no, but the author was some fan of yours. No, it was Astronomy Magazine. It was a Lick Observatory or something. All right. I, uh, I, I'm ready to admit that there are a number of coincidences about the year 2012, and some of them are ominous. Well, I'm very hopeful, and I mean the with movement. Any I, credibility <laughs> to St. John the Divine? No, I don't zero. give St. John the Divine any credibility, except that... The, no. the only thing is that from the morphogenetic field point of view, there's quite a number of people believing St. John the Divine. Now, that I have to take seriously. He felt a quaking in the force, that's all. But it's up to mm. cooler heads to figure out what this quaking of the force is. I mean, we have much better techniques than John the Divine. So uh, nuclear winter is much more likely than any of these other things we discussed. Well, but see, really I don't think a nuclear war is likely, but without a nuclear war, just with continued toxification, CO2 outgassing, CFCs, da -da -da -da, this and that, the scenario is totally apocalyptic. See, I think we are facing a serious ecological crisis, an evolutionary challenge of unprecedented, you know, James Lovelock. If we don't have a miracle every day, we're not the, going the, to the, make the present, uh, Extinction is the one of the eighth largest catastrophes of the planet in its lifetime. So far. So and, and, and so that's happening now. Like we are in something that big. I mean, it's not big. to be the biggest one. It'd be the apocalypse. Well, that's but why you right don't need there. John the Divine to exactly. tell you that there's an apocalypse underway. The scientists. But it may not be a fatal say. one because the, the, the there's not a. Uh, um, there's not a prophecy with any credibility to me that says there isn't some way to make it through, although I have to admit I'm extremely doubtful of the intelligence of the species to find Well, it. it depends on what the limit, what's causing the problem. If you think man is the problem... Man is the problem. Well, wh what about this sudden appearance of large and repeated glaciations in the last five million years? This indicates either something is wrong with the sun or the geodynamics of the planet. There this never were be glaciers before. No, there never were glaciers before. Glaciers are new in the life of the earth. They're uh, not something that you see back and back and back. And all parameters of planetary stability become more and more unstable as you approach the present. Now, is that just that the older a planet we're, is? We're hovering in a field of chaos, yes. Well, it's so maybe man is the problem, or maybe m human beings are the answer. Well, the, the Earth could zip off its orbit and head out to space. That's a possibility. But it, it, it does seem to me that the, uh, the, the ecological catastrophe is the appropriate interpretation of the apocalyptic vision at the present time. I agree with that. Well, so do I, but I don't think they're alternative views, because historically speaking, this millenarian apocalyptic tendency in Christianity, which inspired millenarian movements through the ages, inspired, among others, the Pilgrim Fathers to come to a new world in America, which was seen as the chosen land, you know. It's all part of the same kind of thing, this prophetic tradition. Of, uh, so, and it also inspired Bacon's vision of unlimited progress through science and technology, through organized research, the transformation of nature, man's conquest of nature through putting nature on the rack and torturing her. This a man's dominion over nature was there in order to bring about a kind of millenarian state, a technological ut utopia, the first technological utopia, uh, where there'd be peace and prosperity and there'd be these wise scientist priest figures running everything and always finding out ways to make things better. So it's the idea of a kind of new Eden or a new promised land flowing with milk and honey and material abundance, etc., through the scientific control and conquest of nature. Well, it's that scenario which is now causing the economic catastrophes. That scenario has actually worked. And there's a sense in which the apocalyptic scenario we find ourselves in is a product of the apocalyptic myth of history. Yes, good point. So it's, a, in a sense, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. And I think that the tendency of mythic the myths of science have an interesting dynamic because they start with the Faust myths where Faust sells his soul to the devil in return, to, in return for unlimited knowledge and power for a fixed period, 24 years. But um, when you get to the, um, the, the, the later development, at, in, at the end of the period Faust is dragged down to hell and then in Goethe's Faust, because he's an enlightenment figure who believes in progress, 
that Faust is actually taken up to heaven. He's rescued from the demons at the last minute. That all became implausible. And the modern form of the Faust myth was Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, where the scientist is destroyed by his own creation, no longer by any supernatural machinery. Um, that the, the whole of the kind of supernatural machinery of Faust becomes natural destruction by his own monster in the case of Frankenstein. And it's obvious that the nuclear threat has a Frankenstein quality to it. And it's also obvious that the uh, destruction of the environment and the ecological crisis has this kind of mythological base, which is apocalyptic. Good point. Well, we have to do surgery on the mythological base <coughs> due to the self fulfilling prophecy mechanism that while we don't understand it exactly, we see it working in history. So, in connection with um, r revision of the religion of the West, I, I think one, one good thing would be a modification of the revelation of St. John, or relegation of it to another place. I mean, it ha has to be, I think, reinterpret reinterpretation was the word you suggested. You need to, to switch the vision onto another track. Yes. Yes, well, yes, how can we control the apocalypse is out of control. so that even though we're, the self-fulfilling part of it can't be stopped, it can be steered toward a tolerable conclusion? Well, first one, historical note. But the, the revelation of St. John the Divine is not a unique phenomenon in the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's in a succession of apocalyptic books which abounded around the time of Christ because many people believed that the end was literally at hand. St. John the Baptist's message was repent for the end is at hand. It was a period very similar to our own in the sense that the idea of the end being at hand was widely believed, only too credible to them for whatever their reasons were. Mm. The, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament is an apocalyptic prophet, prophetic book and is a precursor of the um, revelation of St. John the Divine. These are just two examples in a large and extensive literature. It pervades the teachings of Jesus, this apocalyptic sense of um, the, the changing of everything. So, <clears throat> um, where was I? Uh, about Daniel. Oh yes, Daniel, that it pervades the thing and it, it pervades, it, it comes very early on because the promise of the, to Abraham, it starts with Abraham. Um, God promises Abraham that he'll take him and his descendants to another land. He'll give them a land. There's a promise of a land where wonderful things will happen. Abraham's children shall be as the sands of the sea, and he shall be the father of many nations. And these are promises about things that haven't happened but will happen. And through faith in these promises, history is made. And there's a passage in the 11th chapter of the Epistle to the Hebrews, which is, in the New Testament, a doctrine to Jewish Christians. And there's a whole sermon on faith, how the entire motor of history for the Jewish people was this faith in what they hadn't yet seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the passage begins. And by faith Abraham went out to find a strange land, not having seen it, or even glimpsed it afar off. By faith Moses, Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land. And then uh, by faith Noah built the ark, knowing not for what or when. And so when the rains came, he'd already built this ark and everyone else was drowned and he and his family took off. All these things are done by faith and it ends with this thing about how um, the, we, we are moving by faith towards a new state, a promised land. Um, uh, because if we belong to the cities of the world as we know them, we'd go back to those cities, but we're moving onwards. And it ends with that famous passage, we are strangers and pilgrims in this land. So there's this sense of being on a journey through time towards some destiny in the future, which can be a different place like America. The Pilgrim Fathers were inspired by this mythology to come to America and see in it a new promised land. It's inspired the migratory urges of the Northern Europeans for, for centuries now, this vision. Um, and it's also inspired the attempt to change the world through science and technology, but it's so deeply rooted in the Judeo-Christian tradition, that mere tampering with the book of Revelation won't make it go away. It's fundamental to the entire historical orientation of the religion. We need to direct it toward <coughs> a uh, non lethal satisfying conclusion. Well, the momentum can't be... I don't think the momentum of the technological effects of all this can be stopped. 
So he sat in the in a short considering this possibility that I mentioned at the beginning now, which is that there is this intuition is of something profound, that it isn't simply a lethal neurosis, it's the actual anticipation of what is now made inevitable by all this technology. Well, in that case, there's no problem. No, well, I'm, I'm not We're not going to inject the inevitable. We just, as you suggested, sort of like get used to it happening. <laughs> well, get used to the fact it could happen at any time. You see, Terence is so much like St. John, in, in, in both in his St. John the Baptist form and, and in St. John the Divine. Um, this, in, in the Gospels, there's these passages of Jesus which Terence could easily equate and add to his armamentarium. Is that uh, Nicodemus, what Christ no, it's his prophecies in St. Luke's Gospel about how when the kingdom of heaven comes, when it will be, be like a thief in the night. And, you know, in the parable of the, of the seven wise and foolish virgins who are not ready for the end. Many stories that say that, you know, when it comes, it will come suddenly and you won't know when it's coming. And um, yes, you have to like live... a thief in the night and no man will know the moment of my coming. Well, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm yielding now to Terence's view that there's no way to save this vehicle, that the, 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 the basic scriptures are riddled with a self-fulfilling prophecy of apocalypse, and either there is an inevitable apocalypse on the horizon, or, in case there's not, one might be created by the self-fulfilling prophecy, the, the mechanism of paranoid delusion, then um, w w we would have to uh, defuse the time bomb of the Bible. That's a good way of thinking it. Yes. And the Koran. People should be allowed to let the apocalypse happen, not make it happen. Yeah. Which if, we, if, if culture is a fantasy coming out of the unconscious, then you know, we have uh, set ourselves up for this. It's now going to be very delicate to, to guide this through, understand it, stop it, back out. So the, the, uh, the myth of apocalypse, is this then one of the major weaknesses of this system from the evolutionary point of view? It's not enabled us to understand and discover the evolutionary point of view. The evolutionary point of view is the, the apocalyptic vision of history writ large, surely. I mean, the very fact that the notion of human progress... Human progress people. requires the beginning, the middle, and the end, to mm. even got it. Yes. And the All thing right. is that from the idea of human progress, which was widespread by the end of the 18th century, the idea of biological progress, i.e. the same process recognized in the human realm but extended to all life, was seemed increasingly plausible to many people. Cause the idea of life is totally static and the whole of nature is utterly frozen with only humans developing in this mode. You see, when Hegel showed the dialectical development of thought, it was a fairly obvious uh, idea that Marx and others took up of thinking of a kind of evolutionary development of matter as well. In other words, seeing the evolutionary process as not just a human one, but involving all life, and then since 1966, the entire cosmos with Big Bang cosmology. So, I would say that the Big Bang cosmology, which is an apocalyptic vision of history with an explosive beginning and uh, therefore implying an explosive end, is simply a projection, well, I shouldn't say simply, but is a kind of projection of this Judeo-Christian model of history. It's not just confined to churches and synagogues. It's something which has come to be. It's the myth which encloses our entire scientific worldview, yes. which has grown up within this Judeo-Christian matrix. Yes. And it started in no, the human realm, then it spread to... Apocalyptarian. <laughs> it seems inevitable. <laughs> it is inevitable. <laughs> but you see, the evolutionary view gives us um, a sort of vast time scale for this process. It basically, it's still in the same model. It says, sooner or later, maybe in five, maybe ten billion years, our sun will explode. It will follow the course of a grade three star or whatever it's classified as. Not that we know what the course is. <laughs> but the typical course of such a star, we say airily, having observed stars for 
uh, a few a few years. years. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> been years. <laughs> it's been and big supernovas that tell us what happens when the star blows over, uh, blows up are things that we've observed occasionally. You know, like one in 1987. Anyway, so the theory is, it's just a star. It will, like any other star, burn out. It'll either become a red giant or a black hole. I've forgotten which it'll become. But at any rate, that's the, that's the end for us. So the scientific worldview actually does have the same thing. It has, I think, the star, sun becoming a supernova or a red giant and ex killing everything in the solar system. That would be our end. And it would be one that mirrored the Big Bang as a kind of incandescent beginning. That's the scientific view. That is yeah. an apocalyptic view. view is just, a few years. It's just that it transfers the apocalypse to the remote future. So that you don't, you don't have to... It doesn't get rid of it. Yes. It's, it's, it has it. And the heat death of, of the old thermodynamic 19th century universe, the steam engine running out of steam, was a kind of slow but inevitable ending of time. The heat death of the cosmos was when entropy was at a maximum and processes work and that kind of thing came to an end. And so it was a kind but, of... But you see, so we're now we're down to this, we're accepting the uh, apocalypse myth because it's an integral part of the historical concept as the Israelites invented it. And we can't do anything about that. And um, ne nevertheless, this has no implication at all as to the overall longevity of our human habitation on Earth. No, I disagree. I so therefore, the this. paranoia of our culture is manifest in the assumption that it's happening tomorrow. Except that there's ample evidence. It isn't paranoia. Who no, else has a nuclear stockpile? Who else has agent or nuclear Who else bad. has CFCs dissolving yes. the ozone hole? This is not paranoia. Paranoia? The Earth is on fire. Haven't you heard? There's no reason to worry about being too paranoid. You can lift your foot <laughs> off that pedal. It's okay. You can go with that intuition now. The planet no, is on fire. To, f to fasten the fire to a com complete um, incineration in a certain year, no matter what the response. No, that's not what's being said. You can interpret it as the smeared apocalypse that takes 200 years but still ends with everybody dead at the end of it, or the fast apocalypse that takes 15 minutes and could happen today or tomorrow. There are all these styles of imagining it, but the thing the is... The style matters. I think this, the, the, all the, the possibilities style, are the, real. The projection of the um, apocalypse in the year 2012, I think, is actually damaging of our chances of having a future. No, I think it's a way to manage it. If it's just it could be tomorrow, it could be 200 years from now, mm -hmm. that's a little weird. Why not manage ourselves through a narrow neck in a state of high awareness by, you know, there should be tremendous pressure on governments to get rid of nuclear stockpiles by 2000. Yes, to actually, sure. Well, but to use the calendar as a club saying, you know, do you want well, to well, enter the be, third millennium armed like club. barbarians? Do you want to be just like King Canute? He was who was in charge at the turn of the last millennium. <laughs> he wanted to hold you up to King Canute and say, Canute Bush. Two Viking warlords, two knotheads, or do you want to drape yourself in the olive of peace and be, you know, the savior of the world, the unifier of mankind, and so forth and so on? It's My, a great what I'm suggesting you know. is that the coupling of the apocalyptic vision of the revelation of St. John with uh, the concept of the end of time in the year 2012 makes most likely the response of the Secretary of the Interior, who says, well, so what? I mean, there's nothing we can do about yeah, it, so let it go. Going back to the revelation, John, which I would have, have seen, I could have seen this discussion go on with never a mention of it. That's okay. just an obscure Christian text, interesting to fanatics. But the overall world... But the whole idea... Or this issue... What ideas evoke in people's minds through use of the word apocalypse? Our subject here. Well, I called it the end of the world. Good, that's much better. <laughs> it was my notion. That lets John the off the hook and the, and the yeah, Bible. The end of the world. All right. The proposal of the end of the world <laughs> happening in a fixed year is not inclining people to do something about nuclear stockpiles by the year 2000. Like, who cares if the last 12 years have or do not have nuclear stockpiles? No, I didn't link the two together. I meant that the year 2000 
everyone wants to celebrate the millennium by feeling like there's a new style, a breath of fresh air, a new order. So the year 2000, forget 20, Paris striker in the United yes. States. There should be, that would be something. a thorough examination on the part of everybody of their society as we approach the third millennium. That sounds good. That would be a fine thing, I think. You know, it's interesting, when they tested the first atomic uh, bomb at Trinity site at Alamogordo, uh, of the 19 physicists who observed it, there were six who believed that the temperatures were high enough to ignite the atmosphere and that the entire planet was in a, uh, there was a 30% chance that the entire planet's atmosphere would be set on fire by this experiment. And they went forward. They had no reason to believe that this wouldn't happen. That would be an interesting experiment. Well, it didn't happen. It would be, yeah. Not hot enough. And I wondered how that hot was a close it was. One. That was a close one. And this comet coming back in 2012 looks like a close one. That's the definition of a close one. That's a close one. And the, 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 the population the, explosion, what about projecting the population explosion to the year 2012? How many people would that be that continue to pace? I don't know. It depends on whose figures you use, but probably approaching 10 billion. 10 billion people. And ozone, if you take the ozone hole, which we know that's a problem, propagated at the present rate of phase, there will be no ozone hole. So you've got 10 billion people, no ozone hole. Uh, the impact of that single parameter is totally unknown. Uh, the carbon dioxide emission continues. That's a whole other issue. The yeah. acid rain continues. Uh, nuclear proliferation continues. Propaganda runs rampant. Meanwhile, pharmacology, brainwashing, surgical reconstruction, all of this stuff has made new leaps toward great fascist accomplishments. I mean, it's a pressure cooker world that we're describing. And I think under such conditions of cultural compression, forms of novelty will erupt that are totally unpredictable in the present context. And that these are the forces that will create the end of the world. I mean, I think of it sort of like the DMT wave hits the planet or something like that. So much is happening. Everything is knitting together. It cannot be stopped. I mean, there will be cellular technology and human-machine interface and uploading and downloading of clones of people and memories and places and everything. The boundaries are dissolving into some kind of techno-biological informational soup of intentionality. But what is its intentionality? It's not in the hands of any person, any organization, anything you can figure out. It's just the Gaian will, and it's incomprehensible what is happening on this planet. It is like the metamorphosis that goes on inside the chrysalis, except this is a planet that is having its forests liquefied, its oceans boiled, its populations moved, its genes streaming in all directions with all these exotic toxins mixed in. And uh, it has this, it isn't for death that it's well, moving, it's, it's uh, moving towards some kind of other thing, not death. Yes, well that is the new, the new Gospel of St. John is, is what you're raving. Gnostic Apotheosis. The, the, this is the green version of the apocalyptic vision. That the apocalypse is actually this. This, uh, this is the edge. Poison through the rampant infection of the, of the planet by the human Well, species. but is it poison? I mean, you have to remember that oxygen was a deadly gas that totally destroyed the biotic organization of this planet. And in fact, a billion years was spent responding to the presence of oxygen, yet it is the basis of all present life. Yeah. No, I think we're at the I, edge I, I, of I the apocalypse. An apocalypse without having the complete sterilization of this planet, something on the uh, 
of that order that took me a billion years to recover. And yeah. the whole of the evolution of, of life on the planet begins uh, again from scratch at the microbial level. That's right. If these asteroid strikes, nothing larger than a chicken. You would have to do. say that's, that, that satisfied the original St. John's description of the apocalypse. Yeah. So that's it then. Mm. The green version, the green reinterpretation of the, of the Bible identifies the present moment as the apocalypse. Oh, I'm sure. It's not even in 2012. We're on the edge of the it apocalypse. Is. It's a time Since storm. 1847. It's a time storm whose diameter is impossible to estimate, and all we know is that the barometric pressure is dropping faster than you've ever seen it drop, and there's an eerie stillness, and the light in the sky looks very strange, but nothing has happened yet. Nothing it does seem to be yet. out of hand as far as, uh, you know, the scale of something that we could interact with and in any way, I mean, we're the passive observers of this problem. Well, if we could model it. Well, I, are we the passive observers? I mean, so we are also magic, you mean? Well, maybe we can prepare. Right. So dynamics, the apocalypse must have its own inner laws and dynamics. This is what we're attempting to do, I assume. Yes, but it also, I mean, before we uh, get into the actual mechanics, the, I think a bit more speculation is called for. <laughs> <laughs> Surely not. <laughs> Assuming that human consciousness doesn't simply become extinguished at death, we have the question of what happens when millions of people die together, and what happened in Hiroshima when all those people died, or in Dresden, and the firebomb attacks caused this fireball and a uh, firestorm in Dresden. All these people suddenly die together. They all pass through the state of the death experience, not the near-death experience, because this is for real. The death experience, which, from the descriptions we have, involves going through a tunnel, entering a new kind of realm in a different order of reality, rather like the birth canal, but into another dimension. Now, however we conceive of what happens at death, leaving aside only the materialist hypothesis that all just goes blank, um, the end of the world through any of these scenarios, billions of people more than ever before, dying at once or by the, by the million, um, is going to create an extraordinary flux of souls, to put it in traditional language, a, an unprecedented rate of flux. Um, an, in, an, an unprecedented um, passage and uh, perhaps those who die in the same moment through the same cause undergo some kind of fusion there may be some kind of um, psychic being uh, of, of kind of humanity what uh, one way of picturing it in Christian terms is that what's happening to the earth is a global crucifixion that hum the whole of humanity is undergoing a kind of crucifixion and there'll be a moment when the, the crucified body of humanity through the, 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 the collective moment at which humanity gives up the ghost or, or at least large sections of it the nuclear scenario incidentally Ralph, according to its script since the second world war is essentially meant as the auto-destructive Christendom because all nuclear targets bar those in Turkey which is on in NATO but NATO and Warsaw Pact countries with the exception to here are all Christendom and it's Western Christendom in Western Europe and the United States and there's Eastern Christendom in the Soviet Union and Greece and essentially a nuclear, a nuclear thing would be the auto-destructive Christendom which would be very much in the self-fulfilling prophecy mode of you know this particular apocalyptic but the environmental one is much more global it's no longer as we shift from our fo uh, focus of attention to the dangers of nuclear war not that there's any reason to shift from it all the weapons are still there but uh, or as the fashion changes and we turn our attention to the global thing we now see that this isn't just Christendom it's everybody um, anyway if it does involve everybody then part of the omega point or the thing that Terence is trying to uh, describe obviously involves some kind of transition in consciousness which might be achieved through mass death and might be achieved without mass death through something like, that I think turns rather vividly portrayed on one occasion as being like a kind of collective BMT experience. The uh, glory. The glory. I know about this. I'm not sure that I can explain the glory. It's a rat, or oh, they also call it the rapture. 
fundamental of the rapture, really? yes. And the eminent expectation of this thing that they call the rapture, which will be the opening note of the end of the world scenario. And they're carried up into the heavens in the rapture. They're actually born aloft. It's their, a their clothes are left behind as they yes. leave the automobiles going vertically to the sky. Yes. The one, the rapture. You see, it's, it's interesting because we all die. Uh, there is a, an apocalypse built in. It's just that it only happens to you. And so every human life becomes ultimately a, an approach to this question of final time. And what difference does it make that you're the only one that's going to die? After all, that's the one you're standing in. Yes. So it isn't that if you don't live in the age of the end of the world, you don't get to deal with the question of final time. It's just that in this age, the death of the individual and the death of the species are somehow both possible to contemplate. Yeah. And the death of the other species. And the death of the other. It may be, you know, I mean, lots of traditions teach that life is organization for the purpose of creating a kind of after-death vehicle or some kind of structure in a higher dimension which is if carefully made will survive some kind of transition that is potentially uh, could fail and that you're supposed to spend your life doing this well if, if the sun were to explode then the entire biological shell of organizational soul ecoplasm would be liberated in a fraction of a second, you know. We don't know what life is for or what death is for. But I think it certainly makes a difference, uh, what, the way, it certainly makes a difference to the way that individuals face death in what they believe happens to them afterwards. And people who've had near-death experiences, where they've experienced this going through a tunnel, an altered state of consciousness, out of the body experience, so they have the sensation that there's something in them that leaves the body and survives it. An experience which I think is related to lucid dreaming, which in turn is related to dreaming, which is the experience we all have every night, whether we remember it or not, of traveling in other realms with another body, not the same as the physical body in bed, but an implicit body at least. And if the state of being after death is like dreaming without being able to wake up, so that when we die we are captured in the realm of our dreams, we pass through this tunnel and we enter a realm which is more like the realm of dreams than the life of waking experience. But there is indeed a post-mortal active life in, in such a form, um, a form glimpsed in dreams in some kinds of psychedelic experience where the barrier that's penetrated is maybe like the membrane or the barrier that we penetrate at death, and may, may, they may therefore be akin to near-death experiences which I think DMT probably is, um, then if there is indeed this state of individual survival after death, we have to ask ourselves what would be the state of collective survival if indeed our billions of people were wiped off the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, most people don't want to think beyond that moment. It's a catastrophe. We must do everything that we can possibly do to avoid. Uh, and let's start by recycling our beer cans. That's the usual approach. But if you carry it through um, and see what might happen afterwards. Uh, vast numbers of people going through this barrier at the same time, collecting a kind, creating a kind of group mind of a, of a kind never before seen in the post-mortal plane, um, possessed of a powerful imagination, perhaps. I mean, if all of them passed through and believed in the New Jerusalem, the New Jerusalem might indeed manifest in this plane, and, and there might be some kind of um, post-mortal state, which is the attractor, the point is that the, the, there are various ways of thinking of, of, of what it is that's drawing people to this millennium, both in expectation and in dread. I mean, this is the approach of, is another metaphor is the, is the Last Judgment, meeting, meeting God, as Terence put it, like the mind of God coming into history. Um, the, the, it's a mixture, it's no longer just a loving God, but it's the, it's the image of God that certainly has the shadow side in it because it's a, the, 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 it's a dreadful moment. The uh, judgment. Yes. Day of wrath and doom impending, as the DA's era puts it. Yeah. Um, it's an interesting question as to why 
the apocalypse is such a strong attractor, and the attractor is that somewhere beyond that, all the doom and, and, and this moment, there's some other state of being which is extraordinarily blissful compared with anything we know here, and is utterly more perfect. And it's the same fantasy or dream that was the recovery of Eden, the going to the promised land, the coming to America, the transformation of the world through science and technology. There's something quite magical and infinitely attractive that's motivated the entire historical process. And if, in Terence's view, what we experience is some kind of shock wave coming back from the future, that this thing is going to happen, and its approach is sending back these kind of shock waves through time, quite a, <coughs> a, a, I mean, a powerful image, I think. But then we have to consider that this, that this, this is what really is happening, it's the blissful state, or, what, or, or whatever this might be that is actually acting as a historical attractor. It's so powerful an attractor is it, that do as we, whatever we do, we can't escape from it. Once that's been conceived and, and, and allowed to infiltrate not just our religion, but our entire secular, political, intellect, and scientific and intellectual life. So the justification for the Omega Point concept to, to show down is actually this uh, mechanism built into the apocalypse vision. The end of the point is apocalypse, it's, it's, it's the Shardang's conception of the apocalypse, not just at a human level, but at a cosmic level. Yes. Yes, it happens to all nature. And, let me just add one more ingredient to this particular line of thought. When we were at Hollyhock recently, Brian Swin came up and was talking about his cosmological views. Um, and he was exploring the idea that the universe, like a developing organism, has ages at which things happen. It has an inbuilt cosmological time. It's not like the old universe where galaxies were coming into being, others were dissolving, it just all went on forever in endless cycles. There was a time when atoms came into being first in the universe. There was a time when galaxies formed, or at least the great majority of them. There was a time when planets could form. Planets couldn't have formed a minute after the Big Bang. There was only a time after supernovae had been in existence. Stars had formed in stardust from supernovae. The time when planets could form. So, in a sense, just as in a developing embryo, the development has particular times or phases or synchronies. So, if there were life on other planets, that the stage it's at might not be that very different from the stage ours is at. So I said to him, this was the most interesting line of thought, and if, since I'd also been thinking about parallel evolution and their possible effect on us through morphic resonance, interplanetary morphic resonance, similar Gaia's in other solar systems, mm -hmm. planets of the species Gaia will be in resonance with ours, and planets of the species Venus will resonate with Venus, and so on. But we're interested in the Gaian resonances. And I said, well, how far, you know, in just sort of rough estimate, order of magnitude in, in time, do you think they'd be found within a billion years of where we are, within a million, within 500,000, within 50, within five? You know, what just where would you put it? He said, just guessing, 50 to 500,000 years of where we are. Mm. So there might be, you see, similar processes. That's really a big bang. I don't understand. Why because of this developmental theory of the cosmos. I understand cosmos. that, but yeah. my guess would be 500 million years. I mean, you have to be reasonable no, with the no, size well, of the universe. Yes, but take into account morphic resonance. If there is indeed morphic resonance between the planets, so that when a new form appears on Earth, it's vastly more likely to appear yes. on other planets. You, you could have a greatly accelerated evolution on other planets till they were almost caught up. So if any got in far in the lead, the morphic resonance effect would tend to make the others catch up. It's a I little bit like your time work. Yes, it's a cosmic synchronization principle. The next yes. place you can check this is 4.5 light years away, and that may not be suitable. There is a sun-type star in Centauri, 1.1 solar masses. If there were an oxygen-rich, water-heavy planet there, you could... Uh, it could call be a them twin up. Earth. Call Haven't them up. we been here somewhere before? <laughs> <laughs> the <Hello>? Islander. <clears throat> what are you doing about your apocalypse problem? <laughs> but the thing is, you see, that the, the Christian apocalyptic version, the, the vision, 
has several forms. One's the local human one, it just happens to people. Like the Jews going to the Promised Land, it didn't change all nature, it just meant they got other people's vineyards and took over other people's fields and killed the native inhabitants or reduced them to some second-class status. A repetitive pattern in history. And, um, but th this was a limited vision of how, where this whole pro process was lent. It, it, we, then it got more and more elaborated, this apocalyptic vision, until in time of Chandon, it's the end of the evolutionary cosmos. And it's not just the big crunch, it's much more immediate than that somehow. And so it's this attractor pulling forward, so it's this cosmic vision. But the thing is that it seems to us unlikely, given our standard old-fashioned cosmological view, that anything that happens on Earth would affect the rest of the cosmos. But if lots of Earths are synchronized, and if there yeah. is, you see, then, then we do indeed begin to get the sense of the possible cosmic apocalyptic. And I don't know yeah. how much... Well, you that's an interesting idea. Well, it's interesting. The cosmic the, the, the end time of the cosmos. The end of the soul of the world. The end of the, yes, or the total transformation of the soul of the world. That it may be a maturation process, or that's, you know, because present cosmology hasn't got very much to offer in the way of what happens in the future. I think you've got endless expansion, which seemed persuasive to people in the 1960s when it was generally believed that economies could go on expanding forever and forever. So a cosmos that went on for yes. Then people got worried about the big stock market crashes that all going, the whole thing ending in tears. Then we got more big crunch scenarios on the market. You know, it may have maybe just enough yeah, dark matter. They say it's close to the indeterminate value they can't. Attend. Exactly. Now they've got into a very subtle position, which I'm sure the medieval schoolmen would have admired as a, as a solution to the problem, saying that we're hovering on the very brink between an ever-expanding and ever-collapsing, not so close to the margin that it's impossible ever to tell. Yes. Okay. So, but, you know, these are, these are rather uninteresting visions of, of the future. Well, you've, you've actually created another mechanism for an apocalypse. It happens somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then by this kind of imploding process, once one pops... It's a chain you know, reaction. It's a chain reaction. And the stars <laughs> would fall from heaven, <laughs> and the lights of the galaxies <laughs> would go out, and... Uh, well, it's the similar end. to this time travel problem. The God Whistle, yeah. The God Whistle. That's yeah, right. It's a special version of the God Whistle. Yeah. A synchronization of God Whistles, cosmos-wide. Yeah, it's a cosmic chain reaction uh, at a certain developmental stage that just pulls everything down into it. We have to believe that the universe is stranger than we can suppose. Yes. And that's the way by avoiding closure and keeping that in front of us, I think we will not go far wrong. The trouble is that at the apocalypse, if it happens, the hermeneutic cycle will come to an end. Yeah. <laughs> 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 if it happens in 2012, I'm sure I'll get no credit whatsoever mm. for having been run. <laughs> it would be a bit late for a credit to be much value to you, wouldn't it? I suppose so. Well, I... Um, Raptural New Jerusalem might have to take its physical existence in another universe. I mean, only this universe will pop. Right? Yes, well, what is it, this New Jerusalem, that everybody leaves this machine of sapphire and emerald and shall suddenly that descends from the sky and in which there is uh, you know, a world of delight before the presence of God? And this is the promise. This is the covenant. This is the fulfillment of the covenant. Is that the ocean will boil, everything will be lost, and do not give up the faith. Because at the landing of the ark, the covenant was made, not with Abraham, but with Noah, with humanity, and it will be redeemed. There was all this, yes, this, the pledge will be redeemed. The, the promise will be kept. Don't throw away your coupons. They'll be cashed in due time. That's right. The promise will be kept. I think it probably will be kept. Well, I do believe we've transformed I think we've the apocalypse myth suitable for the purple and green church. You think that we've... Uh, we've transformed it, yeah. Well, the, the, the green church of Brazil already has a version of the apocalypse myth, which is... Um, 
they believe in very strongly. And, and they, in theirs, the, the dragon in the last days comes and eats up the forest. They say it's an Inca prophecy um, and burns and destroys. Um, a dragon, incidentally, which is prophesied at the very beginning of Anglo-Saxon liberal political theory in Hobbes's model of Leviathan, because the dragon that's destroying the Amazon forest is the great monster Leviathan, which society, in Hobbes's view, is uh, uh, the aggregate, like cells in the body, individuals are like atoms in the body of Leviathan. And there's a dragon in, in the revelation of St. John. Yes. So the body here's, of heaven crushes the head of the serpent. So here's the serpent, which is, and, and in the last days, the, the, the struggle between the, the, the serpent and the forces of light grows ever more intense. People are forced to take sides because it no longer is possible to sit on the fence because the fence itself is crumbling. And there will be an intense polarization through the 1990s, in their view, you know, towards the coming of the millennium, because these forces become ever more powerful, preparing for the final battle. Well, this is a, a fairly traditional version of the millennium. This is already one adopted by what one could call a green church. And it's one that um, sees the struggle that's going on now as, as being of uncertain outcome, in a sense. Uh, although, through faith in the victory over the dragon, the, the victory will be achieved through faith. So, it's another form of seeing faith motivating faith in some future state, motivating the struggle. And it's a powerful inspiration. And actually, without some such inspiration, I don't think the Green Movement can function properly. Yeah. And that means that any apocalyptic vision that either sees the apocalypse as inevitable, mm -hmm. or as something we can't do anything about, mm -hmm. is, as you were suggesting earlier, perhaps destructive in its effect. Mm -hmm. But an apocalyptic vision which sees it as a process in which we're participants, and to which we can make some difference, then unleashes this kind of heroic um, heroic archetype. Incidentally, I think that both the conquest of nature and the environmental movement are under the aegis of the heroic archetype. In one of them, uh, the hero is saving humanity from the ravaging powers of destructive nature, like the battle of doctors against cancer. In the other one, the environmentalist is saving the virgin, virgin nature from the onslaughts of, of this destructive dragon of our uh, Leviathan, which is devouring the forest, polluting the world, shitting everywhere. Um, so anyway, they're both under this, under this archetype, and maybe it's too late for us to escape that particular heroic archetype either, because the only thing that can motivate the um, green movement is a heroic archetype, whether it takes the form of actual guerrilla fighting or whether it takes the form of non-violent resistance, a kind of Gandhian and uh, Christian version which will generate martyrs who will then have this great archetypal appeal. But only some such millenarian faith, I think, could motivate the green movement sufficiently fast enough and sufficiently deeply enough to change the scenario. And so I think that we're, this is another way of saying we're so in the fold of this millenarian in, 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 in its field that only another millenarian scenario could yeah. possibly help undo it. Rubbing it out, getting rid of it, forgetting it, suppressing it, mm -hmm. psychically engineering it out of our psyche, I think we're past all that. Yeah. That's why a jihad to save the earth doesn't sound like a half bad old time. It feels with him and chaos shall return. The middle name of chaos is opportunity. Well, well we have to earn somewhere. Yeah.